Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this new webinar of the International Society of Gynecological and Endocrinology. Uh, we are here today for an uh, online BTX session, and uh, the topic today is uh, transsexualism, adolescent trans transgender, and endocrinology, or transsexualism. Our experts today will be Professor Shah Sultan. Uh, Professor Shah Sultan is from uh, the University of uh, Montpellier, Medical School at the University of Montpellier in France. Uh, he's been president of the French Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology. Uh, he's been vice dean of the Montpellier School of Medicine and director of the International Federation of Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology, president of the World Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology Congress, uh, as well as director of the French National Program for Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology. He is an uh, editorial board member of the Journal of Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology, as well as of EGO, the uh, European Gynecology and Obstetrics. Professor Chasu has also published an amazing number of articles in peer-reviewed journals. Our second expert today will be Professor Svetlana Bujovic. Professor Svetlana Bujovic, PhD, PMD, internist, endocrinologist, head of the Department of Gynecological Endocrinology in the Clinic of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Diseases of Metabolism at the Clinical Center of Serbia, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Belgrade. She is president of the Serbian Menopause Society, founder of the Belgrade Gender Team, member of the board of the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology, past board member of the European Menopause Society, past board member of the International Menopause Society, and she published 30 books, among them the um, Serbian Medical Encyclopedia, and she has 450 papers in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, we have uh, our chair today is uh, Professor Andrea Genazzani, Professor of Gynecology, as well as scientific and uh, uh, medical researcher in many files, including endocrinology, embryology, and fertility, with numerous publications and books. He is president of the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology, ILG, former president of the International Menopause Society, editor in chief of uh, GRIM. Gynecological and Reproductive Endocrinology and Metabolism, the new journal edited by ASG, and past editor-in-chief of Gynecological Endocrinology. So I am now asking you to start uh, your videos, and uh, uh, I leave to Professor Genazzani to introduce you. Good morning, good afternoon to everybody. It's uh, my pleasure. Uh, we are uh, today in one uh, of these uh, pre-congress uh, webinar courses, uh, waiting for the, our congress in Firenze, in Florence, uh, to 5 December. And this uh, has been dedicated to transsexualism. It's a very interesting, attractive area, transsexualism. And uh, we have uh, two fantastic speakers. One originating from the world of uh, pediatric endocrinology, because it's the first moment when we have to face the problem, and one originating from the big world of endocrinology, which have to give us a specific aspects, how to follow, how to treat, how to permit that each one individual can reach its desired gender, even though sometimes it's different from the natural gender. And then it's my pleasure to invite uh, the first speaker, the first speaker is uh, Professor Shah Sultan. He will speak about adolescent transgender, new concern. Please, Shah, you have the mic. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> uh, can, I, can I start my slide, please? Yes. Perfect. <clears throat> so, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I would like firstly to thank uh, Professor Genazzani for having organized this uh, webinar, and uh, it's for me an honor to share uh, uh, the, it with uh, 
uh, my uh, friend and colleague, Professor uh, uh, Vujovic. Uh, thanks to Professor Genezzani, it's a fantastic uh, uh, problem and uh, we will try to, to help other uh, professionals and share with, uh, with them uh, some of our experience, some of our new concept on uh, uh, transsexualism. I think it's, um, it's necessary to start by uh, definition. What are we talking about? We're talking about uh, gender dysphoria, which is a general term uh, that refers to an individual's discontent with its assigned gender and its identification with the gender other uh, 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 that, uh, that uh, associated with its birth, which is usually based on a physical sex characteristic, I should say external genitalia. So dysphoria, it's a general term uh, that relate to uh, uh, the distress and uh, any experience. And the term, uh, it's, um, it's more specifically defined when used as a diagnosis. So gender dysphoria, it's a general term. As a matter of fact, there are different expressions that uh, are related to uh, 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 abnormal uh, sex identity. It's transgender or trans man or trans woman, I should say, transgender or trans sexualism. Transgender, and this is a, a very important to keep in mind, transgender refer to the broad spectrum of individuals who identify with the gender other than that associated with their birth sex. And uh, on, the, on the same way, uh, trans boy or trans girl or trans uh, male, male, female or female, male, transsexual or male, female, transsexual. It's a person who phenotypically for one uh, uh, natal sex register or assign as one sex and who identify as the opposite sex. So as a matter of fact, transgender and transsexualism cover the same situation. But in my opinion, it seems important to remind what we're talking about. So gender dysphoria, trans, it's a general term, transgender or trans male, female or female male transsexualism correspond to the same condition. So we have also to remind very shortly, uh, or, or to, I'm sorry, to remind or to discover that these conditions are actually exploding. There is a dramatic increase of gender dysphoria and uh, uh, mainly in children as well as in adolescents, a dramatic increase. As you can see on this slide, during the last 10 years, the, the amount of, uh, of children and adolescents refer to gender dysphoria, uh, uh, dysphoria has been multiplied by 10 during the last 10 years. And as you can see on this slide, which take, which uh, correspond to the English experience and Gary Butler report the English experience of uh, children and adolescents uh, with gender dysphoria, as you can see, from 2011 to 2017, 
the amount of uh, the number of patients referred for gender identity disorder has been multiplied by 20 from 100 to 2000. So without any discussion, there is a, 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 an explosion, a dramatic increase of patients uh, uh, referred to as uh, 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 gender dysphoria. We don't have, we don't actually have the exact epidemiology, the exact uh, 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 prevalence of gender dysphoria. I don't know if, why, but there is a wide variation in the literature about the uh, 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 incidence or the prevalence. As you can see, within two years, the uh, uh, epidemiology has moved from nine, uh, uh, from one to 14,000 for male to female to nine out of 1,000, which is terribly elevated. But these are referred to uh, uh, as adult uh, uh, gender dysphoria. So maybe uh, Svetlana will make comment about this specific aspect about the increased incidence. But for children and adolescents, uh, we do share the same concern. So that's the reason why it's a very good idea of, uh, to have organized this, uh, this web for all endocrinologists, gynecologists, and all practitioners. So just to remind very briefly, the uh, gender development and the main factor involved in gender development. Chromosomes, hormones, play a key role, we'll have a detail, uh, we'll have a, a detail in a few minutes. Uh, secondary sex characteristic, which is because this is the, the main way to, 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 to identify the uh, uh, sex uh, uh, at birth. But uh, uh, gender development uh, depends also on brain structure, mind, socialization, among which family, religion institution, which is important, and culture, which is also important. And uh, within culture, we do include uh, theory, practice, and value, and ethnic group. Uh, if I have time, I will uh, give you some, uh, some example of how the ethnical and religion uh, uh, environment play a role. So gender development depends on many factors. As you can see, I don't have too much time to go into detail, but just remind you that there is a, di se a differentiation, a sex, sexual differentiation of the brain. And the male brain or the male female are uh, not uh, regulated uh, on the same manner. I mean, in, in male, testosterone uh, uh, during the fetal life had the key role uh, in brain printing and development. Uh, during adolescent, male has uh, some impact on the network connectivity. Uh, the, the brain male during adolescent does present a larger gray matter volume. And during adulthood, there are several differences uh, in the brain volume, in the gray matter, and, and specifically has, has been reported uh, some years ago, there is a larger volume of the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis, which was some years considered as the key role on the uh, gender identity uh, 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 in May. While the female uh, uh, brain is regulated differently, but I don't have too much time. 
So let's move to the definition, or I should say to the criteria, which are necessary to identify gender dysphoria in children. So please go to the right part of the slide. So gender dysphoria should be diagnosed by at least six of the following of the following items. A strong desire to be of the other gender, a strong preference, and this is very, very easy to identify in, in, in children, a strong preference for wearing clothes, typical of the opposite sex, a strong difference for cross-gender roles, a strong preference for the toys, game, or activity uh, usually used by the other gender, a strong preference for playmate of the other gender, a strong rejection of toys, games, and activity typical of one assigned sex, gender, a strong dislike of one's sexual anatomy, and a strong desire for the physical uh, sex activity that match one's experience gender. So as you can see, we are very strict to identify gender dysphoria in children, at least six items of the uh, following eight. While in adult and uh, in adolescent, uh, uh, the definition is based on well-known characteristic. And since my, my, my time is uh, limited, uh, I, I just remind you that uh, the parameter, the criteria has uh, uh, more or less the same for adolescent, but maybe uh, Svetlana will come back to this uh, definition. So transgender or, or gender dysphoria, and this is uh, an information we were sharing for many, many years, may occur in children or in adolescents with disorder of sex differentiation. The first and the more characteristic, the most characteristic disorder of sex differentiation is given by congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which occur in XX in the female fetus. You know, everyone must know that in this condition, there is an overproduction of androgen in the female fetus. And this is characteristic of, uh, uh, it's brought a lot of information about the role of androgen during the fetal life. There are many other disorder of uh, uh, sex differentiation that has uh, a given have, uh, have been associated with gender dysphoria. I have a lot of experience in this condition, as well as in congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and there are at least three conditions: the five alpha reductase deficiency, which occur in XY raised as female who change their identity at puberty. The second in the 70 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, raised as female who got a male gender identity. And the other is a partial androgen insensitivity, uh, uh, usually raised as a, a female or sometimes raised as female who got a male gender identity. So, just to remind you that in X6 patients with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, whatever the block, whatever the kind of congenital, whatever of the importance of the defect, we found uh, in a European project, in a pro European paper, that girls uh, with congenital adrenal hyperplasia uh, do present gender dysphoria uh, among uh, a nine to 15 person. So that means that this patient had high risk 
to develop gender dysphoria. They are raised as female, but they present a, a, a female to male transsexualism. So this has been reported by many others. This is one of our work uh, recently published in Journal of Sex Medicine. So if you remember, the uh, 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 sexual uh, dimorphic uh, uh, process is mainly dependent on chromosome, hormone, environment, and so on and so on. But we know now that uh, during the fetal life, development exposure to endocrine disruptor may affect, may impact the uh, 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 gender development and the sexually neurodevelopmental process. There are beautiful uh, uh, experimental data and and uh, one of the uh, first paper reporting, uh, confirming, uh, was uh, uh, published by Shana, uh, Shana Schwan, who report that uh, phthalate, which is a, you know, an endocrine disruptor, phthalate exposure during the fetal life uh, did reduce masculine play, did reduce male behavior in uh, infant. So that was the first evidence of a prenatal contamination by endocrine disruptor playing a role in sexual uh, 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 identity and gender development. So that a very new concept do endocrine disruptor who which are anti-androgen block virilization of the brain and are boys, the question is very uh, a recent question, are boys turning into girls because of man-made chemical because of endocrine disruptor. And this can be a, a very important aspect of transsexualism. We have a good example given by uh, uh, this uh, infant and adolescent whose mother has been uh, exposed to diethyl stilbestrol during their gestation. So we have been involved in a national study uh, uh, along with the French court of, of death mother. We have analyzed the uh, identity of 500 DES son. And among these 500 DES son, we have identified four out of 500 presenting a male to female transgender, which is a high incidence in this uh, newborn. I don't have uh, enough time to detail, but now they are adults but their transsexualism start in, during infancy. All of them did present a strong desire to be of the female gender. They had strong preference of wearing female clothes and so on and so on. So it was a infant transsexualism uh, that continued to adolescence and that led to surgical intervention in uh, 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 three out of four of these transsexuals. So DES, DES, which is, it raised very important concern, uh, induced 100 times higher transgender dysphoria that in control since uh, we uh, uh, do have, uh, according to uh, this slide, 100 times more gender dysphoria in DES son. And since DES, it's a good example of endocrine disruptor, can you realize that more, most of our newborn are contaminated by pesticide, 
and all endocrine disruptors. This raises a big concern for the future. So, uh, during the last part of my talk, I will, uh, 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 please let me know if you want me to stop, but I need five minutes more. It's okay? You can, you can. Okay. So, what are, I would like to share the recommendation of managing transsexualism in uh, uh, infant and adolescent, and this has mainly uh, uh, coordinated by Peggy Cohen from Amsterdam, along with uh, uh, Meyer Wall uh, Balbrook from the States. So in prenatal the recommendation, we do have to assess the prevalence and predictor of persistence among children with gender dysphoria. We do have to examine how to outcomes of a gender affirming model, and we have to examine the impact and implication of social transition in childhood. In early pubertal development, which is actually the optimal timing for intervention with a, a GnRH analog and puberty blocker, we do have to assess the effect of puberty on mental and social health behavior, assess the impact on, on safety of pubertal blockade, but this is known by all endocrinologists, and so on. And in late pubertal, I, I should say in uh, at least uh, uh, Tanner 3, we uh, uh, should consider that uh, it's optimal timing for intervention, and we have also to determine the impact on, on this uh, 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 steroid replacement in this uh, patient who do have a GnRH analog treatment. So, the committee uh, uh, from uh, uh, transgender adolescent has established some uh, criteria from puberty suppression by GnRH analog, and uh, you can read by yourself. Uh, what are the conditions, the criteria, and we do have to keep in mind that uh, uh, the management should start by the age of 16. So, if we uh, uh, decide after all the investigation to start a generic treatment, we, we have also uh, some condition some uh, uh, criteria and we also need the parent agreement and the addition uh, the, uh, the addition of the parent to this treatment lastly i would like i would like to remind that this adolescent need primary care consideration at home uh, transgender raised conflict with family members. These adolescents are at risk for homelessness, which is important. At school, they are at risk for being bullied, uh, for having, for being harassed, for receiving verbal or physical abuse by adulthood. They also are at a risk for uh, uh, substance use such as alcohol, tobacco, drugs. Some of them may have a, a kind of sex anarchy. And don't forget that this will be mainly true at adolescent and in young adult. These patients do present mental health disorder such as depression, anxiety, and suicide attempt or suicide. suicide. That means that it's a very transgender in adolescence, it's a very complicated situation that need a pluridisciplinary group, an expert group that include an endocrinologist, a pediatrician, uh, a, a psychiatric, a psychologist, a, a, a pediatric or an adult surgery, and this cannot be managed by own without any expertise 
certitude. Mr. President, uh, dear friends, uh, maybe I've over time, but uh, I try to shorten my presentation. I would like to thank you for your attention. We don't. Okay, I'm sorry. I was telling that you have left the situation just in the moment that uh, to better understand now Svetlana Vujovic, we speak about endocrinology of transsexualism, also to understand exactly not only in adolescence but also in adulthood what we can do. Please, Professor Svetlana Vujovic, you can make your talk. I would like also, one second, I would like to invite everybody to send, in, to go on question and answer and to write your question, and to write your question. This is fundamental for us to receive your question for the discussion after the talk of uh, Professor Vujovic. Please, Svetlana. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Professor Genazzani for all efforts he has done. And I'm very privileged to have the story with Professor Sultan from Montpellier. Thank you. So in Belgrade, we have a team uh, which work for 30 <laughs> years. And until now, we have 300 patients following up during 30 years. So uh, is the sex just one sex? No, there are four types of sex, gonadal, chromosomal, phenotype, and psychic sex. Uh, very often it's the same and then it's normal, but sometimes in biology, they are not always all the same things. When we have uh, just a different psychic sex, then we have transgender persons. So it's kind of psychohermaphroditism, let's say. Sex chromosomes determine sex and sex is biology, but every cell has a sex and determination about the sex. Non-gonadal effects of the sex chromosomes coupled with gonadal effects through genomic action result in sex differentiation in gene expression in every cell. So that non-gonadal functions are androgen sensitivity, coagulation, energy metabolism, immunity, blood pressure, apoptosis, synthesis of norepinephrine, etc. So about uh, definition, we have uh, heard a lot of, from Professor Sultan, but it's characterized by suffering from strong persistent discomfort between biological sex and experience expressed gender. And that's in the focus of their problems from the early life until uh, the end of the life. There are many definitions in psychiatry, but that people want to have a secondary sexual characteristics of opposite sex. And that transsexual identification is permanently present. So it's not a, a part of some other diseases. Etiology is until now unknown, but there are some uh, hypotheses like effects of gonadal steroids on hypothalamus, disorders of androgen to estrogen conversion, receptor disorders, or maybe aromatase changes. And the gender identity is developed as a result of interaction of the developing brain and gonadal steroids. And according to Schwab, some changes in vol volume of saprohismatic nucleus. So many hypotheses, but until now, not definite story. We're as well, long uh, androgen receptor gene was one of them, but it wasn't something what was confirmed on. What are differences between female to male and male to female? And there are many studies about that incidence. But in our country, among 300 people, it's uh, the same. So the same numbers of female to male and male to female. It depends of, uh, of some surgeons who know to operate very well uh, male, uh, female to male transsexuals. So what's the aim of endocrine therapy? To help the patients to look like a person who or she, uh, he feels they are, 
they have to do a normal sexual function and work abilities. So therapies, individually, lifelong tailoring with gonadal steroids. What uh, we do in our center uh, before the operation, we induce estradiol ampules, 10 milligrams every seven days. And after six months, we add progesterone, 100 milligrams for 10 days and cyproterone acetate. After the operation, estradiol ampules or estradiol valerate. So always natural estradiol and micronized progesterone and CP8 during three years. So then we can see breast enlargement after one month of therapy. Uh, during the third month, it's loss of erection and ejaculation. Sexual hair is thinner after six months and significant sexual hair reduction after one year of therapy of male to female transsexuals. Why progesterone? Because it decreases the number of estrogen receptors and it shows more affinity for androgen receptors. It stimulates 17 beta dehydrogenase. It has anti-mineral corticoid effects and sedative and anti-convulsive effects. What about spermatogenesis in them? Uh, it stops at the level of spermatogonia. Seminal tubal atrophies uh, happened and decrease of lydic cell numbers. So there are some changes and we can see what's going on with breasts in one typical male body. Then after seven months, after 19 months of therapy, uh, one male on the very beginning, after six months, after the operation, so like a typical female genitalia, and it's one male to female transsexual. So we can't ever think about it, uh, that per person that it can be a male. What about gender affirming therapy of female to male transsexuals? Testosterone enanthate, 250 milligrams every two weeks and dehydrated estrogen gel twice daily on clitoris because of clitoris enlargement. After one month, we have acne, tenderness in inguinum. After six months, loss of menstruation, deepening of voice, clitoris enlargement. After nine months, changes in uh, uh, bead trichotheric circumference. And after one year, decreased breast volume, male phenotype, and spread sexual hair. So we can see that changes after 18 months with acne and typical male uh, hair and clitoris enlargement until uh, about six centimeters prior to the operation. So William Harvey in 17th century told us that heart pump the blood and the blood circulate. So uh, uh, the role of estrogens and androgens in both sexes are very important because of their influences on lipidemia, insulin resistance, endocrine dysfunction, inflammation, hypertension, and our adding of other, or female to male, male to female affirming therapy must to be very careful. Uh, because estradiol receptors are present on cardiomyocytes in the heart, fibroblast and epithelial cells, as well as progesterone receptors. So we have to think about both hormones in male to female transsexuals. And what about testosterone receptors in a, a male? Uh, the greatest density, it's in coronary blood vessels. So we have to be very careful with that adding of testosterone to female to male transsexuals as well. And when we are talking about blood pressure, uh, X, Y chromosomes are very important for blood pressure. In exoterner, we have very often hypertension. So uh, all that changes we have to think about. And of course, think about genes, sex series, and environmental factors, as Professor Sultan have mentioned. What about uh, later on when operation was finished and uh, endocrinologists have to follow up that person's for whole life? In male to female transsexuals, we add estradiol valerate and progesterone in tablets or in gels, according to the presence of maybe some uh, presence of thrombophilia or not. And in female to male transsexual testosterone enantate for three months, one ampule or testosterone gel. So what's the aim of endocrinologists? 
it's uh, to reach the happy way of life in all transgenders. Thank you very much. And now, uh, uh, we are, uh, now we will start the discussion, starting question first to one to Professor Sultan and one to Professor Vujovic. I am going on question and answer. We have an anonymous who make a question for Professor Sultan. The question is, is there any sex ratio for transsexualism in adolescence and why? So it's, it's difficult to give a definite answer because we don't follow as many patients and each group has his own data which are different. But in my small experience on transsexualism within the last 30 years, I should say that I followed much more male to female transgender than the opposite. And uh, I, I, I don't have an explanation. It's not a, a, a definite answer, but this is my experience, my very small experience on adolescent transsexualism. I should That's say... Sorry. Okay, okay, that's no, no, please, 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 no, no, go on, I'm sorry. So, I follow several adolescent girls with uh, uh, X6, congenital hydronal hyperplasia, with uh, uh, X6, so with male gender uh, identity at, uh, at puberty or later, but I had to manage many more XY with uh, 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 transgender, a uh, female uh, transsexualism. Thank you. Professor, yes, Bush, do you want to add something to Professor yes. Sultan, please, please? Yes, maybe. According to our experience, it is uh, more difficult to make operation in female to male transsexuals. So, virtue of surgeon is very important. In our country, we have a great surgeon, uh, uh, internationally well recognized, and he was someone who discovered a way of operation. So many patients from all around, around the world came to Belgrade because of female to male surgery. And that's one of the possible explanations. So we have the same ratio. Thank you. I, I would like now to have a, a question now for you. Uh, you, and uh, my first question is from an anonymous uh, uh, participant. He asks if there are any limitations for hormone affirming therapy. Uh, according to the latest study and our experience, there are no age limitations. It depends on uh, the individual necessities to add hormones. And the aim of all our work is to have a, a happy and healthy person. So uh, from time to time, one year, once yearly, we tested them, all of them, and then uh, we add as much hormones as they need. So we have the oldest transgender person who is 75. And uh, that person is uh, now female and she is receiving estradiol gel and progestogel. So uh, there are no age limitations, just individual necessities. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, we have another question here from an anonymous for Professor Sultan. And uh, can you comment on the significant rise in the number of transgender among young people? Uh, <laughs> this is not a, <laughs> an easy point. It's a difficult question. I should say that, first of all, 20 to 30 years ago, in the media, among peers, among sexual identity, was not discussed, was not discussed, was not evocated. Uh, between adolescents. Now, 
if you just remind that uh, uh, sexuality among adolescents has become, uh, I mean, uh, a kind of very common discussion, not only in the high school, but in the, in the TV, in the radio, everyone talk about his, his or her sexuality, it's become more common to talk about this, uh, uh, I should say, gender dysphoria. This, I think it, it's supported by the media, mm -hmm. by the fact that people are, I, I mean, parents are become more flexible and uh, maybe because there is a tendency to homogenize the male and the female sex. Can you realize that in newborn, just an example, in newborn with a disorder of sex differentiation, I manage hundred on newborn in this condition, I am not allowed to determine along with the surgeon, with the, uh, as a pediatric, the sex of rearing. It's forbidden. I can, I can be brought to jail by uh, the patient uh, later on. So uh, it, it's a kind of uniformity of the sex difference. And in some country, there will be a, 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 a load to put on the cart, uh, sex male, female, and to put other. Yeah. So that opened a new concept of our society. I'm talking about European society. Eh? Maybe in, uh, in uh, some Arabic countries, different. But in, at least in European country, uh, the, the sex identity has decreased its value. Its value. So maybe that's the reason, but I don't have any other. Uh, maybe I have another one, but it's uh, uh, raised a big concern in my opinion, and it's many other, uh, uh, I mean, a big leader, don't forget that most of our fetus are contaminated right now by endocrine disruptor. More mm -hmm. than 100 endocrine disruptor are found in the corn blood. So that means that in the future, I am convinced is not a hypothesis, that we will have many more gender this male female gender dysphoria in this contaminated fetus and since all of them are contaminated the rise i mean the the increase will be drastic we have uh, one question for <clears throat> i think svetlana uh, it's coming from andres uh, weisblut from chile he asks, uh, what special concern will you have on endocrine treatment of transgender patients who are HIV positive on antiviral therapy? And second, what would you use to control pilosity and fascial air on patients in estradiol treatment? Uh, first of all, there are no problems with HIV persons, so the same treatment like in all others, and it is just adding what they need so uh, it's not uh, important what other therapy is. When we are talking about the facial hair, uh, then, uh, 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 then we have cyproterone acetate, 50 milligrams uh, during uh, four years of the beginning of therapy, plus enough amount of estradiol, which is higher than normal for just substitution. And then uh, hair is they are losing their hair everywhere. Just maybe to add something to Professor Sultan, I really think that media encourage this uh, talk about uh, transsexualism. And in some Arabic country, it is prohibited. So they're coming to Serbia for making operations. And we have a team uh, where psychiatrists is very important. They are very important because they make diagnosis. That's not just like go to Singapore and make an operation for money without any psychiatric uh, looking on. So uh, there are differences in the world for that people, and uh, we have to know that. Yes, I will. I will now take the opportunity to answer to Mariela Deikas. She asks, what local treatment can be used to improve the quality of the neovaginal tissue 
in patients undergoing male to female when it does not respond to estriol and the systemic treatment with estradiol and progesterone. You know, uh, Mariela, the estriol is a very efficient molecule, but uh, its effect on the neovagina tissue is limited. You have to go back to estradiol. You have to give her local estradiol administration, not so much estriol. And this is independent from the total amount that you are giving for uh, the general treatment. You have to add local estradiol. And then now I would like to, to make another question that we have received here, also from an anonymous, to Professor Sultan, which is, uh, why should we identify adolescents with transsexualism? Why? Why? Uh, because, yes, a very important, uh, very important question. First of all, as I, I mentioned before, transsexualism in adolescence is accompanied by many, many uh, side effects or many consequences. First, social consequence, psychological consequence, we do have some adolescents who did suicide. So they need some psychological and psychiatric support. Three, uh, uh, some of them left their home and became a homelessness. Four, they, uh, as I mentioned, some uh, of them has a, a kind of uh, uh, a sexual activity without any sense. So they uh, are at risk for uh, HIV and uh, many other transmiss uh, uh, sexual transmissible diseases. So there are at least five or six reasons that we should identify. And last but not the least, uh, I mean, really, for those who have managed adolescents, it's a very, very sad condition that increase during puberty. Can you realize that I have a, 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 a boy that uh, has a male to female transsexualism and he refused his penis and he took a slave to cut his penis and he was brought to the emergency department. Can you realize? He wanted to emasculate himself. I have only one, but we never published. But can you realize he cut his penis with, by himself? And it was at risk to, to, to death. So why? There is many, many, many reasons to manage, to support, and to, to have an open mind to help this adolescent. It's a very difficult condition. But we have now. Do you agree, Svetlana? Uh, maybe I can add something uh, according to adolescent per persons. We had a very bad experience with GNRH because some of them who are coming from other countries with GNRH have some suicidal attacks because of that and no one changed sex. So that's something from the birth. They feel like they feel and GNRH do nothing. So we start with HRT a little bit earlier in a very low dosages and we can stop it at any time if it's necessary. So we think that uh, GNRH is something what is unacceptable in most of them. Uh, and we have a person who as well cut off penis as well. I, 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 I disagree. Oh. We have now another question for, uh, for uh, Svetlana. Uh, concerning the dosage, are the dosage used for hormone therapy, hormone menopause therapy, the same with dosage of hormone affirming therapy? No, we have to add three times more dosages than for a menopausal treatment. Let's say if we are talking about estradiol valerate, 
then in the menopause, it's enough to give them two milligrams of estradiol valerate plus progesterone. But in, uh, in the very beginning of the therapy for male to female transsexuals, it is three times more. It's three times a, a day. So enough, it's, it will be enough six milligrams or better in an in intramuscular way, 10 milligrams of estradiol valerate weekly. Yes, and also still concerning treatment, we have received a question from Dr. Elena Zago. Does the use of generation to retard puberty make hormonal and surgical therapy more efficient? No, no I don't. No, 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 no. And then we have it's another not, question. Uh, no, why? Because if we give enough estradiol, then we don't need GnRH. That's, okay. that's the most important. It suppressed and testosterone. I think th th this position is not shared by pediatric endocrinology because we prefer to block puberty for two years, having more time, I mean, much more time to, to, to take the good decision and starting a new puberty with steroids according to the sex uh, that has been changed. So I, I won't be so affirmative. Then we, we, we need some more experience. And then yes. now we have another question, Charles, for you. Why do you think, what do you think about uh, transsexual elite athletes in sport? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. How, how much time do you give me? <laughs> no, no, no. I give you, I give you five judges. You have just to give your answer, your belief. Now, this is a very, very important question. And I have participated to the International uh, Olympic Committee on this topic in a meeting in Miami. And personally, I was uh, strongly opposed to, to let this uh, XY, XY adolescent 17, 18, girl who had a disorder of sex differentiation with a female phenotype, but having plasma testosterone at the upper limit of man. So that means that the, with the plasma T at 10 nanogram per ml, your brain, your muscle, your blood, as you mentioned, I mean, all the male consequence of androgen, even if you have a female phenotype and a female body line, because they don't have breasts. Anyway, uh, I don't, I won't suggest to let this transsexual uh, running with the female. It's not ethical to let them Although I know that they, they have a, a very strong lobby in the ICO that permit them to, to compete. I'm talking about the gold medal of the Olympic Games. I'm not talking about... Uh, uh, okay. So this is a very important aspect of transsexualism. But in my opinion, I won't let the transsexual playing uh, or, or running or, or, or competing uh, has an elite woman. This is my opinion. Thank you. Not, and now another question related always to the hormone, uh, hormone affirmative therapy and also hormone replacement therapy is for, for, uh, for you, Svetlana. The question is, does estrogen therapy in female transsexual trigger breast cancer? No, uh, the latest study has uh, shown us that the main triggering factor for breast cancer are high levels of insulin in some patients who have some mutations, genetic mutations for breast cancer. So if we add estradiol in enough levels, there are no more, more breast cancers. In our group, we have just one person, but at the very beginning of therapy, meaning that that breast cancer started five years before. Yes. 
And then another question. It was interesting your part of your talk, Charles, concerning endocrine disruptor. And we have received an anonymous uh, question. Could fetal endocrine risk disruptor contamination make more uh, children transsexual? Yes, definitely. Definitely, yes. I am convinced that beside the media, beside the changement of our society, beside the role of, uh, of peers uh, and uh, on some lobby, I'm talking about the LGBT lobby and so on and so on, I'm convinced that the increase in prevalence of male, female transsexual is related to a devirilization during the fetal life. I'm convinced that we will have more and more male to female transsexual. It's not my own opinion. This question, Professor Genazani, was raised 10 years ago by Professor Goren in a Genazani World Congress meeting. He raised the question. Ecological endocrinology meeting, always. Yes. And, and he then... raised the question in a meeting on endocrine disorder. He said, don't you think that they could have some impact on the brain, I, don't, I mean, on the identity. Professor Louis Goren, which is an expert, if you remember, an expert of trust. It was a very pertinent point. And 10 years ago, I am convinced that it's a factor that contribute to the increment of male to female transsexualism. And then now we have, uh, probably it will be the last question because we are approaching to the time for Svetlana. As you know, we have uh, plenty of attention of the difference in body weight in men and women, what happened crossing the menopause, what happened also crossing uh, uh, the male uh, under regenerative therapy for prostate cancer and so on. Then the question is, are there any changes in weight during life uh, in transgender people? When we compare them to the no, uh, other um, uh, menopausal women or men with uh, uh, hypoandrogenism, then uh, the most important there is once again hyperinsulinism because people gain weight during aging. But when we add enough amount of uh, hormones, I mean gonadal steroids, and if we uh, decrease insulin levels whenever they are increased, then there'll be no gain in weight. Thank you very much. And then now we are at the end. I would like uh, from each one of you, we will start uh, first with Svetlana, ladies first, and then with Char, a final comment for our public concerning the problem of transsexualism today and how we, gynecologists, pediatricians, endocrinologists, have to take an open mind for that problem. Svetlana, your two words. Uh, thank you. We have to understand that uh, uh, there is not always so simple to be male or female. There are many, many changes between the typical characteristics and uh, philosophies of life is going to some maybe disappearing of that typical changes. So in the future, we have to uh, help them to have a, a nice life, happy life, and uh, medicine uh, has the aim to help them. Thank you. Nothing and then else. The comment of Shah. I think uh, children or adolescent transsexualism is a very serious situation. We, we must have a very open mind and we must avoid to, to, to claim that this situation will disappear at puberty. This is the old vision, old vision of transsexualism. Although the, we, we may have some transient transsexualism, we know that at puberty, 30% of adolescents do have some transient uh, disorder of uh, sex identity. That's true, but it's not transsexualism. So we have to keep in mind that this is a very difficult condition to take into, we have to take it into consideration and not to banalize this situation because it will induce dramatic consequence for the adolescent 
and I'm convinced for the future added. Thank you. Thank you, Zetlana. Thank you, Shara. I would like to tell you that you have a series of very nice and positive comments from Manu Navani and from Pauline Maki, from Yumi Ikeda, from Galina Lesko and many others who made the compliments for the quality of the, of the uh, webinar of today. And thank then, you. Friend, uh, we thank all of you and uh, we will invite you in two weeks from now, it will be the 2nd of July, where we will have uh, another uh, uh, webinar dedicated to hormones and mood. The speaker are uh, Rossella Nappi and myself. Rossella will speak about premenstrual syndrome and I will speak about menopause and mood. Thank to all of you for being you. with us and we wait you in two weeks from now. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.